I'm a seventh generation Mormon. My ancestors joined the church in England, migrated to Nauvoo, Illinois, and crossed the plains as pioneers. This is a veritable latter-day David and Goliath story. I have served on the priesthood executive committee for three straight decades in capacity of bishopric, high priest group, elders quorum, or young men's president. And just four short years ago, I would have been considered solid Mormon pioneer stock. I am a Brigham Young University graduate, and over the past 15 years, four of the nation's leading physicians and three of the nation's leading CEOs have solicited my services. One of these was Bill Field, CEO of Walmart, and I currently educate CPAs around the country. Problems really began when I married into an LDS General Authority family in 1989, which quickly proved to be disastrous. When my daughter was six, we received a call from my General Authority father-in-law and his wife Janine, informing us that we needed to tell our daughter that she could no longer sit on his lap because she, along with another six-year-old, was promiscuous with him. Uh, this accusation was recorded by a key witness involved in that accusation. At age 12, my daughter had put two and two together. Her molestation stopped at the same time she stopped sitting on grandpa's lap. This is not the typical he said, she said pedophilia case. Elder Mickelson made the first accusation against not one, but two six-year-old girls claiming that they were promiscuous with him, never providing any detail of what they actually did to him. In early March 2006, three months before my divorce, Elder Mickelson came to my offices unannounced. We began discussing the sexual dysfunction of his daughter, my now ex-wife, and the molestation of her younger sister by the high priest physician that lived next door to them in Idaho. I inquired as to why nothing was done about the younger sister, and immediately he changed the subject by offering me money. Just some quick questions, if I may. I would like to know if this is your doing or your idea. No. Have you sent her to the attorneys? No. And you're not funding her attorneys? Oh, you are funding her attorneys? Okay. Uh, you know, the last time we talked, Ron, the way you treated me, the hatred, the rancor, the, uh, Wait, w w weren't you the one that, w w but weren't you the conversation about my daughter was way, way over the top. Wow. And, uh... I, th I thought we shook hands and left on good terms. Well, we did. We did. I just left knowing that I offered, uh, and, uh, you said, no way, I wouldn't take any money from you. You know, I didn't instigate this at all. Okay, well, I, I just need to know who I'm dealing with. I will uh, we'll be in touch, I'm sure. Thank you. Thank you much. Right. He offered me money. I went to the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles with this bribe, my evidences, and the abnormal sexual patterns. I provided each one of them with a certified letter in 2007 and again in 2008, yet they stood squarely behind their general authority. And quite understandably so, um, they had much more to lose than simply the reputation of one general authority. These Twelve Apostles should be no less culpable than the administrators in the Penn State case. You see, Elder Mickelson's accusation against these two six-year-olds coincided with his being called in 2002 by Apostle Richard D. Scott to co-chair the translation of the LDS Spanish Bible together with him. This explains Elder Scott's orchestration of my divorce. He couldn't be responsible for selecting a pedophile to translate that Spanish Bible. Suddenly, the doctrine of being called of God takes on a whole new dimension. In very real terms, my family was sacrificed on the altar of that Spanish Bible.
the very morning of my divorce, we had our typical scripture study, family prayers, and I kissed my wife before going to work. Two hours later, I was surprised with divorce papers and shortly thereafter discovered that my children were hauled away to the Mickelson compound west of Idaho Falls for three weeks. There they attempted to turn my children against me. My children have offered witness of these attempts. The local church leaders were heavily involved in Elder Scott's orchestration up to four months prior to the divorce. Um, these local ecclesiasts bled me for information in carefully staged priesthood interviews. The scripts of these covert recordings have become part of the court record. Elder Mickelson and his wife Janine even went to the stake offices of my oldest brother in Logan, Utah, and demanded that he attend a meeting. And in front of his stake president, he was threatened and belittled simply for providing a good character witness of my fathering abilities in court. Nothing short of obstruction of justice through witness tampering and or witness harassment. My own mother, who conceived me through an adulterous affair, provided an affidavit against me in court. Obviously, she didn't turn out to be the asset the church wanted her to be. After three threats of excommunication, if I didn't remain silent about the molestation of two six-year-olds, I gave them an ultimatum. If they didn't have my records off the church rolls within two weeks, I was going public with my evidences. And history shows they once again met my demands. Another damning reality is that I represented myself in court in staunchly Mormon Provo, Utah. When the church's legal aid team had me up against the ropes facing jail time, I easily flipped the equation winning primary full-time custody of my three children within a 24-hour period. Why did the church cower so quickly and settle for everything I wanted? Better yet, why was the church involved in my divorce case in the first place? And why did my ex-wife so readily and rapidly abandon her children? Years later, I was contacted by a group of LDS psychiatrists who heard about my case. They asked that I safeguard their anonymity in return for information. They claimed that they were treating child molestation victims of LDS general authorities, and they named two apostles as perpetrators. I also covertly recorded these discussions. From these psychiatrists came the information regarding the 30-year, three-generational pedophilia ring in Oklahoma City that began in Elder Colomore's furniture store, which the prophet Gordon B. Hinckley was referencing in his 1996 interview with Mike Wallace on 60 Minutes. So that your clergymen tend to sympathize with the men, the abusers, instead of the abused. There'll be a blip here, a blip there, a mistake here, a mistake there. This is not a mistake here or a mistake there whenever you re-victimize and threaten the victims into submissive, obedient silence against the standing laws of the land. That, my fellow citizens, is a well-coordinated, well-thought-out effort, not a mistake. Had I not lived the exact same tactics as the victims in the Oklahoma City case, as well as the Salt Lake City victims as portrayed in the book, Paper Dolls, I would not have believed the psychiatrist, and probably I would have doubted my own story. But my irrefutable evidences and the love of my children upheld me. As a family-oriented church that is supposedly led and guided by Christ, you don't call Oklahoma's LDS Congressman Ernest Istook and have him seek favors in the judiciary against the victims. This is not a mistake. This is willful LDS crony corruption. Lastly, as per President Hinckley's words, who used to be my favorite prophet, the victims are not mere blips here or blips there. These are devastated lives. This merely showcases Hinckley's disdain for the victims, the identical showcasing of the Catholic Archdiocese towards their victims. From all of this arose the data that we now have of the infiltration of the occult into the LDS Church, which came to a head in 1991 when the Utah Attorney General's office joined up with the LDS presiding bishopric to perform an internal investigation of this phenomenon. 
Presiding Bishopric member Glenn L. Pace wrote a lengthy memo to the Quorum of the Twelve with their joint findings, which the church has kept quiet for 25 years. Fortunately, Elder Mickelson instructed his daughter to take a copy from the attorney firm where that document was leaked. I still have my original copy from the copy she took. It is both enlightening and mind-boggling for me as a seventh generation Latter-day Saint to see what role this investigation played in both the changing of the temple ceremony as well as the role it played in Elder Mickelson's family dating back to the 1940s and 50s. All this according to the psychiatrist group that approached me. I contacted the office of attorney Jeffrey Anderson in St. Paul, Minnesota, as he was successful in the Boston and Los Angeles Archdiocese pedophilia cases. They informed me that they could not take the case if the molestation by the general authority took place on Utah soil. He confirmed that the church owns the judges via the oath they take entitled the Law of Sacrifice, wherein these judges, law enforcement, and other LDS civil workers take an oath to sacrifice their own lives if necessary to defend the church, many of whom have enacted the slitting of their throats to solemnify that oath. The Salt Lake City Police Detective's interrogation of Elder Mickelson is laughable, literally. They laugh robustly together 11 times in his 13-minute interrogation. Hi, Mr. Mickelson, how are you? Thank you for calling me. Well, I understand you've been trying. Oh, I have. <laughs> Did any of that ever happen so I can just ask that question and get it out of the way? No, absolutely not. Okay, uh, I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> No good deed goes unpunished. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm sorry. So I don't want to burden you with that, having to worry about that. So Ron, because he's part of this, is going to come in for an interview on Monday. And we'll see just how he behaves when he gets here. I'm anticipating an interesting meeting with him. So. He can also uh, be very... Uh, even hateful, so. Yeah, well, and I expect him to behave that way, so. These videos and the detective's fabrication in the police report showcase the blatant LDS crony corruption. I have unsuccessfully gone through the appellate process in Utah to seek justice for my daughter and our family. But even if I were given audience at the Utah Supreme Court level, Four of the five justices on the Utah Supreme Court bench have also enacted the slitting of their throats in taking this LDS oath to defend their church with their lives. With this supreme power, the LDS church has a stranglehold on justice over its victims. Had a Mormon become president of the United States, his oath to the church would clearly trump his oath of office as president. This is a serious concern and a conflict of interest for the people of the United States. It is also a severe conflict of interest in our judiciary system when justice is out of the reach of the victims because the majority of the judiciary is beholden by way of this death oath to defend their church, regardless of the goodness or intentions of those individual LDS judges. It is an unquestionable conflict of interest. Pedophilia is a societal problem. If you're not part of the solution, you are part of the problem. And donating to these entities that perpetrate, hide, or cover for these perpetrators only means that you are a financier of child molestation. Okay, everybody settle.